the 60s, a seemingly unspeakable sibboleth of musical discussion. The ultimate, it was what it was time. Popular music's greatest generation, even though 75% of it is now gone. And a time when music could change the world. Or so they say. It's very easy to slip into dispassionate, algorithm-driven list-making mode when confronted by a task as vast as these rankings. But by the late 60s, we arrive at the music, which is for most of us the first music we've ever actively consumed and participated in, rather than looking backwards on. And that buys us a stake in music, compromising forever objectivity. Why is Crazy Elephant on this list and not Emerson, Lake and Palmer? Because I was slapping my feet on the cool linoleum at the kitchen in Mount Gravatt to Crazy Elephant and probably would have run outside to play Batman or some such had I heard ELP come on the radio. Life was too short back then for dull music. It still is, but I still dance to Crazy Elephant. So that colours the rankings and determines to an extent who dropped out of the shortlist and who made it. So, without further ado, let us sally forth, or Beethoven's fifth, off with 510 Man by the Master's Apprentices. By 1969, the Easy Beats were no more, and a fresh, more ambitious rock group had claimed the mantle in Australia. Meet, for the first time, the Master's Apprentices. It shan't be the last. Next up, it's the Harlem Shuffle by Bob and Earl. Greasy and slick, it took a Rolling Stones cover for me to go back and find this. A masterpiece born of labour in obscurity. 248, the Tra La La song by the Banana Splits. Actually, this is what I'd be doing if ELP came on the radio, watching either this Banana Split show or the Catanooga Cats. The Tra La La song is stuck in my head for 50 years and it's like the national anthem of our house. 247, Space Oddity by David Bowie. I took a quick straw poll across a broad demographic on this. Still the first song people think of when they think of David Bowie. 246, The Zulu King by Cannibal and the Headhunters. This has such a lovely, gentle groove to it, it's intoxicating. One day, of course, the cancel culture crowd will get around to having it banned, no doubt. But until then, enjoy. 245, Plastic Jesus from Cecil McCartney. A jolly little song from one of the genuine weirdos we'll meet on this list. Story goes it was a painting by McCartney that gave Van Morrison the inspiration to write the title track of Astral Weeks. Crashing in next is Sha La 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 Lee by the Small Faces. I much prefer the early Small Faces before and up to this record when they had the power and the swagger and the heft that a great band had. Cheeky, chappy, psychedelia ill behoofed them. 243, It's All Over Now, Baby Blue by Bob Dylan. Bob was never this caustic, never this cruel, never this possessed of this level of schadenfreude and never so right as in any other song. Time Has Come Today by the Chambers Brothers, thumping rock that managed to be soulful, psychedelic and rock hard at the same time. Never made the US top 10 despite spending five consecutive weeks at number 11. Born on the Bayou, Creedence Clearwater Revival. I can't believe how few Creedence songs made this list, given that during the 60s, they barely recorded a bad song on any of their albums. I mean, excellent and atmospheric as this is, it was still only a B-side. The main play was a little thing called Proud Mary. 240, The Inner Light by The Beatles. B-side of Lady Madonna, this is the one genuinely unoverhyped masterpiece in the Beatles catalogue and deserves to be left undisturbed as a golden treasure to be discovered, not as an income generating asset to be relentlessly promoted like the rest of their catalogue. Next up, Compared to What by Les McCann, perhaps more than anything legitimised the jazz in jazz rock. Get the long version and prepare to get down, all the way down. 238, Gimme Gimme Good Lovin' by Crazy Elephant. Bubblegum became, across the late 60s to early 70s, a barefaced attempt to molt money out of the preteen audience, just as rock and roll had done so for teens. Ordinarily, that would be morally questionable, but as long as they were making records as good as this one, who really cared? 
237, Just a Little by the Bo Brummels, an emotionally complex, musically fragile song from a band and a genre more accustomed to 96 Tears style hijinks. Interesting listen. Volunteers by Jefferson Airplane. I've never especially cared for the airplane, not their hippy dippy records, not their hippy dippy politics. But if you're going to declare your politics, it's best done with loud, gunky sounding guitars. And in two minutes and three seconds. Two, three, five, Cinnamon Girl by Neil Young. Who knew he had this in him? Nonsensical lyrics, massive riffage, occasionally off key vocals. Oh, only anyone who's listened to Neil Young for the last 50 years would have known he had that in him. 2.34, Hey Joe by Jimi Hendrix. Inevitably, there'll be a comment along the lines of, This needs more Hendrix. I couldn't agree more. The most titanic single figure of the decade introduces himself with the coolest sounding guitar solo anyone had ever heard up to that point. 2.33, Duke of Earl by Gene Chandler. Of course, sometimes glorious stupidity carries the day. She Don't Care About Time by The Birds is next in. The problem with The Birds was they had too many songwriters. Not counting Bob Dylan as one, Gene Clark was by far the best of them. Too bad for Gene that the second best songwriter in the group was a monomaniac who shunted Clark to the side and preyed on his insecurities and drink problem. Clark died from the effects of his alcoholism in May 1991. He was only 46 years old. 231, I Got a Line on You by Spirit. Groovy, fluid rock music from a band who had a guy in Randy, California, who had the rarest of things for a rock star. A noble death, drowned while saving his 12-year-old son from an ocean riff. 230, I Only Want to Be With You by Dusty Springfield. I bloody love Dusty Springfield. Just in case you didn't know. The best... British singer of the 60s, the best female singer since Patsy Cline, and no one has approached her since. Changed my mind? Don't waste your time. 229 on Broadway by The Drifters, a crucial bridge between R&B and soul. It was around this time that Sam Cooke said, from now on, don't listen to the way the singer sings a tune, listen to the way he sings the words. A perfect combination of songwriters, producers, and singer. 228. Crying by Roy Orbison. Oh, we've all been there, Roy. Roy was always huge in Australia, even when he couldn't get a whiff of a hit in the US or UK. I had a workmate back in the 90s who'd seen Roy on five continents. 227. Tell Him by The Exciters. The record legend has it that upon hearing it in Nashville, Dusty Springfield was convinced to quit the Springfields and go solo and be a soul singer. The record does put forward a pretty convincing argument for doing that. 226, The Letter by The Box Tops. The Box Tops are cult heroes and lead singer Alex Chilton doubly so, a band that had a steady stream of quality hits despite an annoying habit of being in the wrong place at the wrong time. 225, Oh Well by Fleetwood Mac. Peter Green was a darkly troubled fellow and it showed through on this dark troubled record which was captured diegetically as part of the background of the classic Doctor Who story, Spearhead from Space. 224, I Dreamed I Saw St. Augustine by Bob Dylan. One of the many mysteries on the John Wesley Harding album, it is inarguably, I think, one of Dylan's finest vocals. 223, Crawl Out Through the Fallout by Sheldon Allman. Good heavens, American satire which isn't over-precious and incapable of appreciating irony. 222. True Love Travels on a Gravel Road by Elvis Presley. At the end of the 60s, Elvis seemed to realise that he was from Memphis, and there were some darn fine musicians in Memphis. So he took advantage of that and he made some great records. This one has that classic soft Memphis feel that you get from a Chips Moman production. 221. Break On Through to the Other Side by The Doors. It doesn't help The Doors, a band intimately associated with the myth of the 60s, that most of their best records were actually made in the 1970s. This one, however, is a bossa nova, which is kind of, sort of unique. 220, Mr. Dyingly Sad, The Critters. This is just a strange record. People say that the 60s were weird, but they say it from a distance, and I'll bet they weren't thinking of this diaphanous sounding disc when they did so. It's great, but the band can never come up with anything near half as great again. 
219, Dear Dad by Chuck Berry. Chuck Berry still had plenty to say in the 60s, most of it keenly pointed. This is keenly pointed, but also a comedia buffo, as only he could write. 218, Artificial Flowers by Bobby Darren. How could you not love Bobby Darren? This was the B-side of his mega-hit multiplication. The real catch here is not just the bravura vocal, but the dignity he affords his subject. Darren did understand poverty and depredation, so even in full Broadway mode, he couldn't reduce its victims to mere props. 217, I'm not like everybody else, the kinks. There was no keener eye on the UK scene for the UK scene than Ray Davies. This song, the B-side of Sunny Afternoon, was written for the animals, but they turned it down, so the kinks cut it with Dave Davies on vocals. It's an anthem for the dedicated followers of what's not in fashion. 216. Walk a mile in my shoes, Joe South. Joe South is a classic example of what I call the Carol King syndrome. Great songwriter, good singer, but not the best singer for their material. With Carol, it was always Dusty Springfield. With Joe South, it was Elvis Presley. But it never happened between the useless Felton Jarvis as Elvis's producer or the Colonel's controlling of Elvis's publishing. Damn shame. 215, Rua Augusta, Ronnie Cord, mental Brazilian surf rock, something to do with a barely competent sounding motorcycle gang. Ronnie Cord from a town near Belo Horizonte was a steady hit maker in the pop rock and rock and roll vein in Brazil through the 1960s. Sadly, he died in 1986 at only 43 years of age. 214, Great Guga Muga by Lee Dorsey. New Orleans carried on from the 50s to the 60s with a new generation of wonderful singers. Ernie K. Doe, who once said the three greatest singers in the world were Ernie K. Doe, James Brown and Ernie K. Doe, and he was right. Eddie Bowe, Earl King, and most funkily, Lee Dorsey. Great Guga Mooga seems like a pretty hard to find record, but it was worth it. 213, Got to Get You Into My Life by The Beatles. Paul McCartney has turned into a pretentious, history-rewriting, whiny, money-grubbing old cuss. But we should all bear in mind that many years ago he did write Got To Get You Into My Life, so that just about levels things out. Next up, Wang Dang Doodle by Howlin' Wolf. Willie Dixon, it is most lyrically magical and the wolf is growliest and raunchiest. There's a long abiding story that Freddie King played guitar along with Herbert Sumlin on this track. 211, You Came, You Saw, You Conquered by the Ronettes. Hard to believe this song was recorded in 1969 as producer Phil Spector rolls out the classic 1963 wall of sound. Hard to believe this wasn't a hit either, not even making the US Hot 100. Teeth Nervous Breakdown, Rolling Stones comes in at 210. Through the Mid-60s, the Stones managed a tricky trade-off. Mick Jagger's lyrical tonnage versus Keith Richards' rock'em sock'em riffage and Brian Jones' flourishes with Exotia, all producing a great run of singles. Eventually, they tipped it on its end and had to go back to the basics, but mid-60s Stones was a period just as thrilling as the Primordial Stones or the Fin de Sequel Band of 1968-69. to 209, Maggie's Farm, Bob Dylan. Bobbo's fantastical extrapolation of the Bentley boys down on Penny Farm. Time and cachet have beaten this, like a lot of Bob's songs, into irrelevance. But if you think about the first time you heard it, did it not raise hairs on the back of your neck? 208. They've bought the house next door, Melba Montgomery. Certain egregious boobs will tell you the country music is all about dead dogs, dead mothers, dead trucks and women with two first names who ran off with your best friend who also has two first names. Refer them to this song and its ilk to show them just how frankly country music has always dealt with complicated interpersonal relationships. This is living next door to Alice in reverse. 207. Strolling down the highway, Bert Jansch. Great guitarist. Curious singer. 206. Chimes of Freedom by the Birds. Legend has it that this session ended in a fist fight between Jim Dickinson and David Crosby. You'll get pretty short odds as to the winner of that particular Donny Brook. 205. Madam George by Van Morrison. You know, Van is Van Morrison's middle name. His given name is George. His friends don't call him Van, they call him George. 
That's a lie. Van Morrison doesn't have any friends. 204. Return of Django by the Upsetters. Scratch Perry, mad, accident prone, antagonizing, irresistible, and the positive pole that powered JA music out of the 60s and into outer space. The negative pole was Bob, don't change nothing and we still get paid, Marley. 203, Memphis Underground, Herbie Mann. Herbie Mann was always going to be the guy who took jazz into the mainstream, but it just never happened. Should have though, with this funky, twisty, flute tootin' juker. 202, Madness, Prince Buster. Jamaica's greatest musical force. There was nothing Buster couldn't do once he set his mind to it. Hit, miss, didn't matter to the Prince. He was unstoppable in his day. 201, Feed Kilimanjaro, Miles Davis. One of two long tracks on side B of the eponymous album. This is a clear pointer to In a Silent Way. It's an odd record because while side two is state-of-the-art near ambient jazz, side one is unlistenable junk. Funny that. 